So it's quite good that we're talking about this. Yesterday I was out at Rua Tahuna and uh, it's just great to see the clear water running the river, the river out there beside the road. It's just as clear as one thing and uh, uh, I was out there the week before that as well. So my background is that I'm a truck driver and uh, I've been around the fertiliser industry all of my working life from age 18. I uh, started carting uh, fertiliser just across the harbour here at the BAP Fertiliser Works and throughout the 70s and 80s um, farmers started telling me we're going backwards, our production's going backwards. So what, what, is, the, um, what is the reason for it? And there was, a, there was a firm called Custom Blend Feeds and Fertilisers on Maru Street where Bell and still operate from now that had a different approach to uh, soil fertility and uh, as I found out it's the same approach as what we're using now. They, they were using the Albrecht uh, model, uh, which was developed by Dr. William Albrecht. He uh, was an emeritus uh, soil uh, scientist from the University of Missouri, and he operated through the 1920s and the 1950s. And so he um, developed some sound science around soil fertility. So uh, in 2009, I went and listened to uh, Neil Kinsey in Dubbo, Australia, and decided after listening to him for three days at a, at a soil uh, fertility um, conference that he ran that we should bring this model back to New Zealand and uh, implement it. So we did that in 2009. Uh, we started sending soils across to uh, the lab that he uses, which is called the Perry Lab. And uh, what we were doing was we would go out and pull plugs and we would send off one lot across to Missouri, one lot to Hamilton and one lot to an Auckland lab and when we get the results back, they're like chalk and cheese. So what we decided then is, well, let's do some uh, trial work and, uh, and get fertiliser out onto the soils and see what difference it makes. And it's come back really clear to us that the New Zealand labs are not worth the paper that the results are written on. We are getting results from the uh, independent Perry Lab it's the only lab left in the world that does the Albrecht model properly and the numbers that come out of there. Dr Albrecht said if science is true science, it's repeatable and you should be able to repeat it year after year. So when we get a soil test back, we call it a soil audit, back from the US, we get those numbers, we put it down there. We then make up a recommendation of what's missing in that soil to go forward with and make a recommendation for the farmer. So we don't sell a particular um, fertiliser, we make up a custom <coughs> blend for that particular property of what's missing in the soil. What we see is a huge overload in a lot of areas of phosphate. That's the, that's the number one thing. Now we sell phosphate and we import Shishura RPR from Peru, which is a naturally mined product. That's just 19% of our sales. 60% of our sales is fixing up calcium, magnesium issues in the soil because it's been just totally neglected by the NPK industry for the last 40, 50 years. And so we blend agricultural lime and dolomite together to sort out the uh, issues with the calcium and magnesium and it's widespread right throughout New Zealand. It doesn't matter whether you're in Northland or whether you're in Carterton or whether you're in Bluff, uh, <coughs> it's, it's right throughout the country. Another thing that's been neglected by the industry is sulphur. We use a lot more sulphur in our blends than is uh, known by the NPK industry. And sulphur has been underrated and it uh, has a huge uh, uh, value in, in getting our soil fertility corrected. And another thing is boron. Boron, nearly every soil audit that we get back from a new client, the boron levels are about half of where they need to be. About half, 50%. And it takes a long time, it takes three to five years to change these farms around and get the soils corrected. So we, we just do custom blends, we don't have a generic product that we sell to anybody. We try and put an organic um, matter or a carbon source with every blend that we do. So we're buying uh, currently um, compost from Minoki in uh, Kinleith. They, have, they vermicast it, we bring it back into our uh, store. We add uh, paramagnetic rock dust to it. We add um, humates to it from Southern Humates in, in uh, Southland, and we also put um, a Montmorillonite clay, sodium bentonite with it, and make up a carbon blend. 
that carbon holds on to the calcium, holds on to the magnesium, and releases it slowly to the plant. And that's where we get our results. It, it doesn't go out in every blend because it becomes a budgetary um, issue. But where we can, we try and put uh, that organic matter and carbon source in with our fertilizers. Can I just, uh, yeah. I just want to add something to that. Now, when I said there was gold and trade waste, that iwi run organization that runs the vermiculture was part of the trade waste initiative that was set up by the scientists to clean up the Tarawera River. So that stuff that they are using is no longer going into the river and now you're finding out it's being made into compost and it's being used in this fertiliser industry. <coughs> it is a very good use of the trade waste. But I can go on with that because I still do drive a truck and at Pinedale and Pataru they're taking the waste from the Litchfield Dairy Factory, the Tirao Dairy Factory and the, and the waste from the paper mill at Kinleaf and the Verma casting it. They have got thousands and thousands of tonnes there. Fonterra are involved in this project. Not one tonne goes onto a Fonterra farm. We're carting it 2,000 tonne a month from the Pond Pinedale site to Wawa Road in Kinleaf and dumping it. And it's just being pushed up into big heaps. Why? I don't know. Just adds cost to the, to, to the whole process. Just the cartage alone is 13 bucks a ton. By the time it's loaded onto a truck, cart it down, there's another loader at the other end to heap it up. There's $20 a ton more just, just to get rid of it. And it's perfectly good compost. Nothing wrong with it. Beautiful stuff. Vermicast it with worms. So um, some of the case studies. Nati Rongo is a dairy farm of 185 hectares in the eastern Bar of Penny, was returning 12 to 13% return on investment. Independently measured yearly to its owners with half the production of the Lincoln University dairy farm, which at best returned 6.4%. The worst Nati Rongo did was 6.5% in the 2000 and 2000, 2004 and 2005 floods, when 25% of the production was lost. The return at this time was 2 to 3% for the average farmer. Ofokatoro is a sprawling hilly, hilly dairy farm of 550 hectares, with about 400 hectares productive, bordering the Uruweras. It returned 5 to 6%, up to 11% return on investment with lower production again. Its pasture production rose from 10.867 to from eight, sorry, from 10,867 kilograms of dry matter to 16,132 <coughs> kilograms per hectare in the first five years after changing to our program. Steep hills where cows can and do fall down the hill were producing eight and a half thousand. Best flats 21,000, soil flats. The total exchange capacity, which is the holding capacity of the soil, is 11 to 12. Sorghum grew at 11 kilograms in 90 days at 122 kgs per, per day. Kale grew 18,000 kilograms in 165 days at 109 kilograms per day. There was still plenty of room for improvement, but expenditure was limited with everything coming from income on a developing property. Nitrogen input inputs went down from about 20 kilograms per hectare to a low of 3 kilograms per hectare. The locals on this farm reported a large increase in eels, mature whitebait, mushrooms and frogs. Facial eczema used to be a minor problem but completely vanished in a high in incidence year. No facial eczema is the case with all kiwi fertiliser farms after a few years. So we get away from having those facial eczema issues. To do that, you've got to address your, your, your phosphate and get it lined up with your zinc and, and uh, get your zinc in the right parts per million and address the calcium and magnesium, potassium and sodium and get that into balance. Biodiversity is being increased on our farms. Diseases and pests are decreasing and vanish altogether. Production in milk or meat quality increases. I have a client up in uh, Taikura in Northland, who, um, who I said to him, when your beef goes away to be slaughtered, just ask if we can get some omega testing done. And after two and a half years on our program, the omega-6 to omega-3 was at one to one, exactly where it needs to be for good quality beef. Now these people that are dealing uh, with our program are selling their beef to the high end uh, restaurants in Auckland and Queenstown. So as you said, we're after quality, not quantity, and uh, paying big money for these steaks. 
this uh, done, you can look that up at Granddad's Beef, and uh, Tracy Bayless is the woman that's doing that. Why do you think that a company in particular thrashes such a low-grade product and high volume instead of going after that quality, not quantity, of the market? It bothers me. France, it, bothers America, me. Canada, yeah. it bothers me that we are China. commodity traders. We need to be quality traders. We yeah. need to go for the quality. Value added. Value added. Farmers would prefer it too, I'm sure. And, and <coughs> we're called baby boomers here in New Zealand, but overseas people my age have, have got the income now to pay for quality and they want to go to a restaurant and eat quality food. Yeah. It can happen. So on Macbeth's farm, Omega-6 to Omega-3 was at 1 to 1. On two Galatea farms using our program, frogs appeared for the first time in 60 years in the drought of 2013. We have a, um, on, on the Tracy Battison's dad farm in Raglan, they tested the water going into the top of the farm and tested the water coming out of the bottom of the farm. Coming out of the bottom of the farm was cleaner than where it went in. They took the results, because they did this independently themselves, took the results to uh, Waikato Regional Council, didn't want to know about it. <laughs> didn't want to know. That's part of the course. Yes, no. we know about that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he did, they, and they did this on their own bat, you know, just to, just to check it all out. So we've got a smaller farmer with about, a, he's only got a 10 hectare uh, property over in Kihi Kihi. Has been on our program since 2008 and produces only bales, almost no livestock, of very high quality. His average yield is 23,000 tonne, sorry, 23,000 kilogram, and he has produced 26 kilograms per hectare with lucerne. His bales sell at a premium. He can cut and bale in under 24 hours if conditions are spot on, or 36 to 48 hours when conditions are not so favourable. The crops dry down so much faster, and his bales measure 40 to 50 percent dry matter. Crops of lucerne and oats are solid stemmed. So if you go out into a, a lucerne paddock and cut a stem off and look into it, if it's hollow stemmed, it's missing out on calcium and boron. They should be solid. You should look, look at the, look at the um, stem, and if they're not solid stemmed, they're not right. The vast majority in New Zealand are hollow stemmed. <coughs> solid stem indicates high sugar content, polysaccharides. Uh, Miraka was, was mentioned before. Now we've got... Uh, a number of farms that are supplying Miraka. The one that has been on our program since 2012, Matara, that's a um, Tirapurahi Murray Trust Farm over in uh, Tokara, is now the number one top quality supplier to the Miraka Dairy Factory in, in terms of quality of milk being produced. There's no, um, there's no uh, palm kernel going in, it's all, all grass fed, and uh, they're pretty proud of what they're doing there. Their other two dairy farms are number six and number seven. They've only been on the program since 2015. And um, of the top 10 quality uh, producers to Miraka, six of them are farms that we uh, do recommendations for. So New Zealand wide pasture production is falling. In the 60s and 70s, MAF was recording 17, 18 kilograms per hectare. These days, Dairy NZ is struggling to find 16 kgs of pasture grown. Why is nitrogen, nitrogen application going up and pasture production going down? Well, I'll tell you, um, when Mike Joy put up that um, graph of, of Taranaki, some of these Taranaki dairy farms that used to be producing a lot of milk back 10, 15 years ago, some of them are down only producing uh, nine, nine tonne of dry matter now. They've just poured the nitrogen on, poured the nitrogen on, and they're just going backwards a big time. We, we've just um, picked up three or four new clients in Taranaki and their calcium and magnesium is so low, it's going to take us three to five years just to get them up to the levels that they need to be because it's been ignored in the past. So most crops require nitrogen, mostly because they are grown in monoculture. If grown together, the bagged in requirement decreases markedly. Urea statistics, 500,000 tonnes, 2011-2015. Payout dropped in 2016. Urea rose to 600,000 tonnes. In 2017, roughly 300,000 manufactured and 500,000 imported, 800,000 tonnes. We will not recommend urea to any client of ours. In fact, we're trying to get people off urea, but we do use ammonium sulphate. Now, what's not widely known here in the country is ammonium sulphate does a number of things. One is the sulphur action enhances your phosphate availability. It enhances your calcium availability if you've got it there 
and your magnesium availability and it will bring up manganese in the soil. So we use uh, ammonium sulfate strategically and most of the guys that we are dealing with are no more than 60 units of N annually but most of them are somewhere between 15 and 30. We've just picked up a new client in the Waikato who's been using 600 kgs per year of, of urea and we changed him onto uh, ammonium sulfate uh, but now what we've got to is change the whole farm because the system just breaks down and it's like trying to take someone off drugs if you don't do it the right way and bring it down slowly it just won't happen won't happen profitably so we're looking to get diverse pastures that ticks all the boxes along with soil fertility nitrogen fixation correct soil structure anti-compaction erosion control build soil organic matter carbon on our soil test we want uh, the organic matter to be at 5.1% 5.1 to 6 um, percent. Uh, erosion control, build soil organic matter, suppress weeds, attract beneficial insects, keep pests suppressed, improve stock health and production, vanish facial eczema and other diseases, and decrease somatic cell count. Kiwi fruit is an example of any crop. High yields on challenging high water table soils. Even an off year taste band is so good that gross payout does not reduce. Most orchards we have on our program five years or less. Improvements are still to come in quality and quantity. A Gisborne grower went from last or second to be picked to early start in two seasons along with big improvements in quality and quantity. So, sorry, my ignorance. Um, could you tell me about somatic cell oh, count? Somatic cell count is uh, in the milk. So that's a Mastitis. Oh, mastitis. Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yep, I know exactly. Yeah. That's fine. And so, um, so they measure that daily. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, uh, we've got people that have got um, somatic cell counts less than a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And our object is to get it down as low as possible. Mm -hmm. If you've got high somatic cell count on the milk, all they can do is manufacture milk powder out of it. That's all the football. Mm -hmm. and high, high is anything over four hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. should be a lot lower than that. Yeah, so the Gisborne grower, he, he was, um, went from being last, or second to last, to being picked early start in two seasons, along with big improvements in quality and quantity. None of our growers were pulled out, um, bought 16A because of the PSA disease. They pulled them out because of political pressure from Zespri and other growers on account of spore contamination. This approach is um, severely flawed as it is the health of the plant that determines the insect or disease attack, not the number of spores that land on a leaf. This principle was established by Francis Chavosio, the head of the French National Institute of Agricultural Research decades ago, no later than uh, 1985. John Paul of the Australian National University, pests shun healthy plants, pesticides weaken plants, Weakened plants open the door to pests and disease, hence pesticides precipitate pest attack and disease susceptibility, and thus they induce a cycle of further pesticide use. Lutzenberger, former Minister for the Environment in Brazil, put the case bluntly. The more poisons we apply, the more diseases and pests we get. Chabosio was equally as blunt. Disease follows sprays. He graphs his point with Bordeaux mixture versus Zaneb uh, versus Mancazet. After two years on our program, a 40-year veteran of citrus growing topped his Packhouse Awards with three awards for the best of variety and fourth one for the best overall. So we talked a lot about the lakes and, and, the, and the farming around the lakes. We've got clients that have been affected by the... Um, um, the, the Forty million dollars has been spent to try and fix these farms up. Those guys, uh, the values of their farms have dropped. They're now looking to um, uh, sell off part of the farm to become lifestyle blocks to um, get their number of cows down and so forth. But uh, one of the biggest problems that we face is consultants. The consultants that are out there, like the Maritim and Rotorua, have said no more chemicals on our farms. And that's fine, that's a great goal. But one level down, there are consultants running all of their farms. They just happen to earn a lot of money out of selling NPK fertilisers. 
and they're holding on to those farms and still putting pouring the chemicals on them ad infinitum and that's the way it is and we've got people that are um, on those farms wanting to farm biologically wanting to change the way they're doing things but the consultants won't let them and that's the biggest issue we have is the consultants are just hanging on because the dollar rules it's all about greed we work with a guy by the name of uh, David Law he's an ex-dairy farmer in a, uh, farmed all, all his, um, on his family farm in Edgecombe, sold up about five years ago. He's been doing a lot of work in the effluent space. And what he's found is, if you look on the Balance website, they say you should have a pH of 5.9 to 6. That's where you need to be. But what he's found is that if the pH of the soil is 5.9, the pH of the effluent pond will be 6.9. But for that pond to run clear and have ducks landing on it, it needs to be above 7. So in our program, your pH will end up around 6.3 or 6.4. So the, therefore the um, effluent pond will be 7.3 or 7.4. That's clear water running, ducks landing on it, and, uh, and biological activity happening in that, uh, in that um, effluent pond. So the, the thicker the crust, in the effluent pond, the lower the pH of the soil. Correct the soils, come in with our program, correct the soils, and that crust just goes away as a biological activity in the, in the effluent pond starts to happen naturally. And, and so what David's done is he's now um, come up with this biocycle where he starts with the effluent, goes back through, back, backwards from effluent to the cow to the plant to the soil, correct the soil and uh, the effluent problems go away. So um, that's about all I've got to say. Neil Kinsey is the guy that we follow and uh, he's coming back to New Zealand. We're, I'm bringing him back uh, to run a three day soil seminar. It'll be in uh, Blenheim and that will be the 26th and 28th of June this year. Mm -hmm. um, how should Dairy NZ approach the sort of data and information you've got? All they need to do is give us a chance to pull plugs on the farm. And we'll show them the data and, and do a recommendation based on the findings of that. It all comes back to getting accurate information from the lab. That's all, that's all there is to it. 